time, but when, at the first cell division, this is where you get the formation of the central and governing vessel. And at the second cell division, when there's four, two, and two, you have central and governing and the belt meridian like that. Okay? Um, but, can we have the next slide, please? Now, this picture, well, we had to, uh, apples. Max, god damn. Anyway, so here you've got the sperm and the egg. Now these are the outer body chakras. In India, they know about them. They just haven't written about them. Why? Because people weren't ready. But you know, I've seen pictures from India from the 16th century showing chakras coming out the top of the head. And even Sachananda writes about them, but he says that's the next phase of evolution. <coughs> so once you've got it coming together, but see here you've got your Shashumna. Can we have the... And what happens when you get the first cell, you've got the formation of the first chakra, and this becomes the placental chakra, which I've spoken about at other conferences. And, but also in the first cell, you've got, because there's a chakra, there has to be a nadi. So when you've got one cell, you've got Ida and Pingala, and you can see them here, Ida and Pingala and Shushumna. So in the first cell, you've already got Ida and Pingala, the cosmic principles of yin and yang. Next. And this is a picture I had drawn that shows you this is the first cell and you've got Ida and Pingala like this and how it look also represents the yin yang symbol but just with a extra bit there. So that's like the yin yang of conception. Okay. So the next interesting thing is then I came across, it's funny how these books just drop in your lap. I, a month ago I was in a bookshop and I found this book called The Cosmic Serpent by I think his name's Jeremy Narby and it's, he calls it DNA and the Origins of Consciousness. So. But what's interesting is, is that he relates DNA to the principles of the twin serpents. Now, he, this guy's an anthropologist and did all his, his um, doctorate training in Peru and um, was taking, took some of the ayahuasca that they, the shamans take down there. And I'm going to be talking about that. And, um, and he had all these visions. And then later on, he was able to connect it all. And what, one thing that really surprised me through the whole book when I was reading, I kept saying, that's Kundalini, it's Kundalini. And he only mentions it once in a footnote. And um, so he didn't get the Kundalini thing. And so if you have a look here, the twin, you know, the double helix, and how similar it is to Kundalini, and we're also over here, our... Um, twin dragons. And so what is this? And so for me, like what he says is that this is where uh, the origins of consciousness, now why does he say that? Well DNA is a crystal. But what's interesting is that you've got, you know, m m very small percentage of DNA is actually there for coding um, genes, which a gene, the function of a gene is to produce a protein, and but very small percentage is that. And with the, the form of the, um, with the form the, or, or the design of a gene, you have these random, or well, it's not random, these, these sequence of um, bases, nucleic acids that actually ha contain the code. And so it's called an aperiodic crystal in those parts because it, it, you know, the shape of it changes from because the next nucleic acid is different to the one before and there's no pattern to it. But what's interesting is in the so-called junk DNA. Now in the junk DNA, 
so-called, you have two types. You have what's called tandem repeats, which are like long sequences of DNA that will just repeat the same nucleic acids. For instance, you might have cytosine one and cytosine one and cytosine, and it will just go like that for thousands of base pairs. Now that's a periodic crystal because it has like a repeating structure. And then you've got the other part is called transposons, which is parts of DNA that have just been transposed, because DNA is very fluid. It exchanges bits and pieces. And you can get, you know, if you've got a retrovirus, can insert itself in. So it's kind of viral in, in its nature. But what's interesting, and, and what Nabi was looking at, is that DNA well, there's a lot of research done in Germany by this guy called Pop, who's looked at biophotons. Now, I was talking before about photons and as a force. I mean, it's basically light. So it travels at the speed of light. That's quick. And, but the, out of each cell, they, there is a production of biophotons. And where do the biophotons come from? They come from the DNA. Now that's interesting. And so this is a form of transmission of, of a force of information that travels at the speed of light. And what he proposes is if this is a way that cells can communicate at the speed of light. Now that's quick. So it's instantaneous just about. What's interesting, and we're going to look in a minute at, at dimethyltryptamine, which is a, um, the active ingredient of ayahuasca, which is actually a, a hallucinogenic drug. And if you had some here, you would be in breach of the law. Um, but there, they, the, the shamans take it in their drinks. And, um, and anyone who's taken a hallucinogenic drug would, would have had the experience because, for instance, out of the mushrooms, the magic mush, so-called magic mushroom, psilocybin, actually has a very similar structure to DMT. It's almost identical, which is interesting. I didn't realise that, but the, the sh because it's all about shape. And we'll look why. I'll actually go through neurologically what actually happens. But um, so what's interesting is when you're in these hallucinogenic visions, you know, often people report seeing twin snakes or look like DNA and, and this and that. And it's like, and, and the people report the experience, it's like they can communicate with nature. And so it could be, and this is what Nabi proposes, that DNA could be a form of communication or a way we can communicate with all DNA-based life form. That's amazing. And that when they, the, the people take the hallucinogenic drugs, they go into a, a state of awareness where they can actually um, see it. And what's interesting is when you, you know, you're reading through the book, because he's an anthropologist and worked with all these people, you know, the, the tribes, and, and, they, and the guy would say, oh, that plant cures this thing. And in the West Amazon basin, there is so much... Um, medicine has come out of the plants, but the, 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 the number of plants that are found there is immense, but they know which, which cures what. They can tell you. How do they, and, and he said, how do you know that? Oh, the plants told me. Well, he communicated, and possibly through the DNA, but that's interesting. But also means that the DNA can be a, a receptor a storer of energy. How many people here have used crystal in their work for storing energy? Right. And that means the DNA could do the same thing. It can receive and transmit. Okay. So this is... Uh, well, the void is Samadhi in India, communion with God, they call it in the Kabbalah tradition, the Garden of Eden, and the Tao, or the mind of God. Okay, what do we got next? Okay, so this is a picture of DMT. Now, dimethyltryptamine is the active ingredient of ayahuasca. 
and over here we've got serotonin and why have I done that? Because DMT and all hallucinogenic drugs work on serotonin receptors but not every serotonin receptor. There's 14 known serotonin receptors and so once I found this information out, I'm being a, a bit obsessive, you know. I had to, I went out and bought this book on serotonin receptors and so I had to know everything about every serotonin receptor. And there's a, a book by Rick Strassman called DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And um, he, he is the only person that's ever done legal studies in the United States with DMT. And it was in New Mexico, I think it was in the 60s or early 70s or something. It probably would have to be around that time anyway. And, um, well, there was a ready source of people of uh, willing participants. <laughs> Hey, Charles, eh? Anyway. <laughs> I heard you laughing, mate. Okay. So, now what's interesting, but the interesting thing about DMT, it's very similar in structure to serotonin, is that it can actually be produced in the human body. And it can be produced in the pineal gland. Normally in the pineal gland, serotonin gets converted through a couple of steps, two enzymes, and you've got melatonin. But there's another enzyme, if it's expressed in the pineal gland, that's if, it's, it will convert serotonin to DMT. Now, that's interesting because enzymes are proteins, means there's a gene for it because proteins can only be made by um, the, the genetic process of, of it from DNA. So that means the DNA has to know how to when to express that gene or how does every cell in your body which has a, a complete copy of your genetic contact know which, which enzymes to produce because they all produce different enzymes because they have different functions and enzymes govern the, you know, the vitality or, of the human body. You know, they govern how well it works. So how do they know? Well, they probably talk to each other. Hey, you produce, because we've, now we've got this um, possibility of biophoton communication between cells. So <coughs> serotonin, um, produced to DMT. Now what they found, it's produced, they found traces in, in babies that have died straight after birth. So they found traces of it at birth, right when you're born, at death. Also in um, deep meditative states it can be produced and also in uh, tantric sexual practices. 